This is Rob Tebbett for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. He's back. Kala Sauland returns to the channel. How are you, sir? How are you, Rob? You're right, mate. Good I'm very well. On your, on your wonderful silver string. Everything <laughs> good with you? Everything's good with me, mate. Are you enjoying lockdown two Not really. No. How about you? Well, lockdown just another day of madness, isn't it? You know. Good talk with the vaccine. Good to see the Germans coming in with a vaccine. Good to see. Good to see. You know. Um, yeah. I mean, let's hope that has a good knock-on effect for crowds at sport. You know. So I've seen quite a few. It's one guy I follow on uh, on Twitter. This uh, Professor Sakura. He's come out publicly and said, you know, sport with crowds and. I've said it all along. I said it in the first lockdown. I said it's all going to be when we were talking about even events with no crowds. We're going to follow on from football. So half of me being horrible hopes that the smaller clubs who are running out of money. Um, I think a lot of them took big upfront TV checks, but that will only cover them for a few months of the season. So they're going to be running out of money around now. And let's hope that they've got the clout, the political clout, because they should have the clout to get crowds back at football. When crowds back at football, that have a knockdown effect and eventually a hit boxing. So, you know, it'd be, be nice to have some, some live audiences again. But, you know, we'll, we'll make do in the meantime. We had a great final, um, season two, WBSS final without a crowd. It was a fantastic fight you know production as you expect from us um was fantastic but you know, there's no substitute for for the real thing unfortunately mm -hmm. you know it was it was great but it's not what we want to be doing um, and it's, i'm sure it's not what the other promoters want to be doing as well so you know it's uh it's a waiting game it certainly is and um, while you've just mentioned the wbss final let's touch upon that obviously myris bradis um Second time he's been in the WBSS, this time a charm. He picked it up against the uh, Uniel Dorticos. Uh, what was that like? Because obviously I, I remember before the pandemic hit that we were due to go to Riga and the big atmosphere. And we spoke before the fight about, you know, what's it going to be like? What was it like on fight night? But yeah, I'd like to caveat that with the WBSS, even though you didn't have the lights as we would usually, or the, the usual yeah. entrances did look very good, Callow. I'll give you well, that. We had, we had, actually, Rob, I've got to correct you. We had more lights than I think any other indoor boxing show in the history of boxing. We had, we smashed some records that night in terms of lighting. It looked like a Star Wars show. So the fans that we didn't have, you know, I've seen all these murals put up. We had one light per fan missing. <laughs> so we must have had 100,000 lights in there. It was incredible from a production point of view. The team uh, at the WBSS, they, they pulled it off and smashed it. First event of any promoter between two proper number one, number two of the division since the pandemic hit, facing each other, one from the other side of the Atlantic, bringing them together, all that moving target stuff all paid off. And it was, uh, it was a great fight. It was... Uh, it was a tactical fight. I wouldn't say that in a, you know, sometimes when you say, oh, tactical fight, it was a, it was a boring fight. It wasn't, it wasn't a boring fight. It was both, both, on, the, both on the attack. Myris very much using the counter-attack. Uniel, obviously, with that big right hand. And, uh, you know, he, he definitely won the first few, but then Breedis turned the screw with the uppercuts on the, on the, and the left hooks, especially on, on, the, uh, on the counters. And it was, it was a great performance and cements his position as number one. Uh, number one cruiserweight on the planet, um, as you do when you lift that RD trophy, you know, whether it's Josh Taylor, Inui, Callum Smith, Uzik, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been a fantastic ride so far. And now we're gearing up for season three, which has, you know, attracted a lot of attention with the weight classes we've, we've mentioned, you know, the, obviously the heavyweights and the females, um, potentially a female weight class coming in, you know, talks about the light heavies, um, flyweights, um, which I like a lot. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to look at, but unfortunately it's not really about the weight classes at the moment. It's about how you stage it. Is it behind closed doors? You know, what does that vaccine announcement this week mean for the sport? You've sort of got to get your crystal ball out and look into that as well. So it's, it's not only how... Um, or what what you're going to be producing, but or what you're going to be promoting, 
but how are you going to be doing it, where are you going to be doing it, and when you're going to be doing it, uh, and under what conditions you're going to be doing it. I do think that the tournament format has a massive advantage over your normal promotional business in the lockdown time, in the pandemic time. Um, you know, we showed that with the way we put on the final, which, you know, we didn't, we didn't change the final in any way in terms of who was involved. Um, we didn't say, we'll do it in Europe. Well, you know, Dorsey Corsi can't come over, so we'll get another European in. Um, we didn't do it in the States and get rid of Breedis and, and do Dorsey Corsi in America. We, we brought them together, was the first one, first promoters to do it. And the reason we could do it, I still feel, is, is the way the tournament agreements are set up, the way the tournament is run as a business. It's run over a season and not as an event. Uh, so you've got those those advantages over a over a normal promotional business, which I'm obviously familiar with as well. So I can I can see it from both sides of the fence, and um, I think that stands us in good stead for next year because whatever supersonic virus is coming out of Germany or wherever it's coming out of, um, it's good. But as we see, you know, it's going to take a while, and it's going to take a you know, boxing isn't going to go from no crowds to a packed Wembley Stadium. That's not going to happen. We're going to have to go through the trenches. We're going to have to go through them opening the big arenas and only getting a few thousand in there. Which, by the way, I know the listeners or the viewers don't always have that sympathy for the promoter. But let me tell you, as a promoter, that's probably worse than it is now. Now you don't have the cost of the venues. But once you open up, you're going to have the, all the costs of the venue. It doesn't matter if you've only got a few thousand in there. So you're going to get very high costs, even if you only open up ringside tickets at very high prices. It's not going to make much of a difference. You're going to be losing money. But we've got to go through that part in order to get back to the full stadiums and crowds and, and arenas and whatever it is. And the good thing at the end of the tunnel, light is at the end of the tunnel, and I feel for the, for the, for the, especially for the small hall promoters, the ones who rely on those gates to put on the shows, um, I think it's fantastic, uh, fantastic that there is some light because the whole industry from the, from the very top always relies from what comes from below. And um, it's good to see promoters out and active. And, you know, it's, it's a tough time, but I, I do feel for the ones that, that is either starting out in their career, haven't had those major paydays that they can go back to the savings account this year or something. They, they, you know, they haven't made their own money, you know? So, you know, trying to get young talent out. I see, I see promoters doing that. Or, you know, I don't need to say any names. I think all of them are doing it to some degree. I think it's great work. Great work from the, from the big promoters. It's very well said. Um... Sticking with the WBSS, Calla, obviously the obvious question here is when can we expect to see the, the Season 3 unveiling? When, when can we expect to find out the weight classes you've been teasing us for months, it feels like? So we're feels like years. Busy. Feels like years. Normally, I like a bit of a tease, an announcement of an announcement of an announcement. But I'm not going to lie, what do you want me to say? I mean, <laughs> we're waiting to see where we can stage these events over a calendar, you know, over a tournament calendar. Now, rewind, we were going to announce season three in after the, after the final, which was June in March this year until our wretched friend Corona hit. So that's off. That's all off. So now we look at next year, hopefully the early part of next year. You know, that's the, that's the best answer I can really give right now. Um, what will be clear is by the end of the year, more the direction of, of the weight, um, whether strategically we can make that public or not. Um, normally it creeps out anyways. Well, you're very close to sources of information normally, so I'm sure you'll be telling me what the weights are soon. But joking aside, we, we have had those promoted discussions already. We, we, you know, we have an open conversation with a lot of promoters, get their ideas, and um, we work off, off those weights that, that we feel are best for the sport, best for what we do, which is finding the best in the sport. Um, but it's, you know, it's Corona times, and there might be a, a bit of a different angle on it. That's why we've thrown the, thrown the heavyweights in there, for example. 
you know, could be the time to do that sort of thing, you know? Is it maybe the time next year where we go down to only having the semis and the finals? Because that's, that's what logistically makes the safest thing to deliver. Don't think so, but it's something that ultimately isn't decided by myself. I can only put forward ideas, which is then decided by the board. So, you know, um, busy working on about 50 scenarios, which should only be two or three. So it's, um, from that point of view, it's, it's locked down, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a busy lockdown. <laughs> Well, we wish you all the best with it. I mean, I've gone on record several times. And it's no secret I'm a great admirer of the World Boxing Super Series, as every kind of hardcore boxing fan is, or very not, much, if they very much well should be. Um, when you say the heavyweights, Caller, obvious, the obvious question around the heavyweights is that you've got AJ and Fury making millions and millions and millions and millions. Is it unrealistic to expect those guys to join a heavyweight World Boxing Super Series? Listen, you've got to dream big, of course. We'd love them to, you know, but um, it, it sounds like there was a lockdown deal done already for that. So the scenario you could look at is, of course, you know, in an ideal world, there'd be a way of doing the whole thing. But what a lot of people are talking about and what I've talked about as well. Um, well, one of the one of the many options for next year is, is is looking at is looking at doing those fights that we're all talking about at the moment. You know, this week the, the one that uh, I've been asked a lot about is is Hergovic Hunter, two guys that were going. You know, last week, you know, in, in next week we'll be talking about um, Joyce Dubois probably again, yeah, which is a great fight coming up. But there's loads of those fights. You know, two weeks ago we we're talking about Chisora Uzik. You know, it was a cracking fight, you know. Um, so, you know, th those, are, those are three fights. You, you just named three potential quarterfinals, you know. So, and there's an abundance of them. You know, there's loads out there. So it's a very, very easy one to make. You know, you could even, whatever eight we came up with, you'd have people moaning and groaning about who'd been left out, which is always a good sign because... If people are, you know, if there's that much quality to go off, we can't really get it wrong. Even at court final stage, you're going to see amazing fights, you know. So, I think that's, I, th I do think it's in terms of entertainment, it's a move away, of course. If, if AJ and, and of course, uh, you know, the, uh, Tyson Fury at the moment weren't in it, you'd say, oh, but it's a move away from the best versus the best. Yeah, it's a move away, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's different times at the moment for everything. And I don't think many people would argue with that. Um, in fact, I think it would be a, a rather popular choice. Um, but, you know, I love, I love the idea of the females as well. You know, you see this weekend, um, cracking triple header. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of good news around the females. And I think that the lockdown has done one thing, it's given them a stage. Mm. Yeah? Now they've had that stage before. So I, I think that all the talk there, this is new and everything that, you know, um, we've been involved, I've, well, I've been involved as well in, in, in female boxing since well over a decade. And, um, you know, going back to the uh, Cecilia Breck, who's, um, you know, Clara Svensson in the state, in, in the state, wasn't it, in, in Sweden. Um, we had some massive, massive fights in Scandinavia. Germany, Regina Helmish, um, you know, was the first female boxer to box for, you know, millions of dollars. Um, so, it's, you know, it, it has now sort of come to the, when I say the mainstream, I mean, I mean the UK stream sort mm. of, you know, market, you know, we've got Katie Taylor, great personality story, the champion, massive following. Um, but there's so many, there's a depth and, you know, it's, I've said it before, Rob, um, it's not about doing the WBSS in any way. It's not about just getting, you know, a weight that sounds nice and having a champ in there and he goes or she goes or he goes and, and smashes up, you know, three opponents to lift the Arley Trophy. It's not what it is. And that hasn't happened. Even a newie when people say, oh, it's, it's, this guy, you know, how many seconds is it going to take? Mm. We all know. Fight of the year, not in WBSS terms, in the whole of boxing last year was Inouye Donaire. You know, that was the fight of the year. So to do that, though, you need a depth. So it's not about, oh, that weight, let's do that weight because Canelo's in it and you've got one star. It's not about the stars. It's not that, so that's not what makes 
the fights that we love to see in the WBSS, it's the depth. And that's why I talk often about the flyweights. I could get, give you mm. 14 flyweights to go in there. You look at the light heavies, you know, very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, middleweights is one that I looked at the other day. It was, it was very interesting, you know. So there's, there are lots, but you've always, the, the criteria is not what the oh, easy net weight class, what brilliant weight class. No, it's about how many great fights do you see, do you visualize in it? And then from that point of view, I've got to say that the, the females pop out, the heavyweights pop out as well. You know, and there's, and like I said, the flyweights um, and a few more. Okay, that's all for WBSS stuff. We're going to move on to some more Salem related business um, next. But before we do that, I think it's also worth pointing out that the second best fight of the year last year was Taylor Progray, which was also a WBSS final. For me personally, that was the fight of the year. Taylor Progress, purely on the basis, it didn't have the drama of the knockdown and, you know, the, the you know, a, a new E then wobbling. But with Taylor Progress, you saw boxing at the highest 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 technical level but not just technical power everything and there was might not be knockdowns but there was a lot of second wins and third wins and fourth wins on that fight from both sides yeah and i still still think that josh taylor for me best super lightweight on the planet i think there's massive fights out there for him i hope that ramirez fight gets made i think teofimo lopez in the future great fight and there's um, Terence Crawford, you know, although I think he's got a very tough fight with Kel Brook. I don't think Kel's got something left in the tank there. We'll, we'll see what, we'll see what um, Crawford's made of this weekend. I'm pretty sure about that. We certainly will. We'll come on to that before we finish. Um, but before, we mentioned um, female boxing, of course. Katarina Thanders this weekend challenges for the WBC Super Featherweight title. You promote her. You know her. Tell us what to expect from Katarina Thanders this weekend. I've got to correct you. My brother promotes her, Rob. But, I, but I'm obviously, obviously uh, I'm a big supporter. Um, she, she, look, at the end of the day, she's got a big, big weight on her shoulders because there's a huge expectation in Norway. Now, you know, the, maybe certain viewers will think, oh, Norway boxing. Yeah, but don't forget, Cecilia Breckers came from Norway. So it's sort of a chance for her to, to you know, she has the interim, she wants the world title now, and this is the moment where she's got to step up. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, think, I think she's the underdog, but she's a Viking, Rob. She's a Viking. So fathers will bring the thunder. Right, so um, talk victory. You know, she's a great girl and a, and a great fighter. So I think um, why not? You know, I mean, she's 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 shown it at a, at a good level. I think it's a step up, but you only find out when you step up what you're made of. And uh, like I said, Viking, Viking blood. <laughs> what about that story? Is that have you heard about that story? My brother told me the story about the girl who didn't make weight. And the trainer told her to shave her hair off. <laughs> that was an incredible story. I I've, I've really seen a bit about it. I don't know. I haven't been that much on the on the social what were they called waves of this week. You know, I haven't been too much on the social pages this week. But it but apparently yeah. that I mean that is one hell of a story. That's front page. You imagine a poor girl, man. She shaved it and apparently made no difference. No, she blew the weight by like four pounds. <laughs> Oh, she had uh, some very heavy raster locks. I can't imagine. Um, I can't imagine that making any. I've heard of some other crazy ideas on weight, but that, that one that is a first. Poor girl. Maybe she planned it before and she wanted to shave it off. <laughs> Not uh, right. You mentioned it before, so I'm going to ask you about it. Philip Hergovich, Michael Hunter. Yes. I've been championing that fight all over Twitter, putting polls up, and Michael Hunter said he wants it. Eddie says he's happy to make it. Yeah, that's a brilliant fight, Keller. I think it is. It is. I would like to see that fight. It is, and and you know, Philip um, uh, spoke straight off the fight. Um, my brother was over there. He wants that fight. And he wants a lot of fights, <laughs> but but that's the one that he wants. Um, I think it's a cracking fight. I think, you know, we've. We, you know, I've always said when you when you talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk eventually. And we we talked the talk with Philip, and Philip's talked the talk. But to be fair to him, he said from day one, 
it doesn't matter who the opponent is, you know? So it's more us who've gone step for step, build him up a little bit classically. I mean, we mustn't be, I think it was his 12 fights out of um, You know, it, it's still, he's still in, in, in professional terms, still a baby almost, but he's not because he's been around. Anyone who knows anything about boxing knows Philip Hergovic since a decade. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it feels like, you know, it must, wasn't long ago when he, uh, or it was long ago, but it doesn't feel like long ago when, when Hay was, was caught in, in sparring for the, for the Fury fight when he had to pull out. You know, there's, there's certain, there's those videos that you saw of him as a 20, early 20 year old, you know, landing lever on lever with Wilder. I know that was a sparring session, but I mean, Wilder in sparring can bang as well. And they were banging each other. And don't forget his age at the time. So I don't, I don't normally read too much out of those gym videos and things, but that one was spectacular. It was almost, uh, people kill me for saying this, it was almost pay-per-view. <laughs> but, so you know, but he's been around for so long um, on the scene. So everyone has noticed that this, it's not that it's a new thing, Philip Hergovich, you know? It's, it's just that he's now coming, obviously, to the front of it and, you know, spoke... Um, this week as well with, uh, with with Eddie, of course, but also with um, you know Philip's manager, with Philip. You know they're all all buzzing for that fight, and um, you know try and get it made. And, and I think uh, talk is that that we hopefully get something on for February. You know, so it would be very exciting. How difficult is it to match Philip Hergovich? Because he actually started off with some some fairly good fights early on in his career, but it seems to me like he's got to a period of his career where he's knocking on that world level and the opponents have become more and more difficult to get. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, I, no, listen, absolutely. I mean, the, the lockdown hasn't helped. Yeah? Um, I mean, the, the people were making a lot about this opponent we put him in in Denmark. The reason for that was we had a show planned in the States which got moved yeah, because of, because of Corona, of course. So he had to get out. He was like, you know, he's calling me up, I cannot, I need to punch someone in the face, right? So it was not like this poor guy we got in. And, and you know, you saw, I mean, anyone who hasn't seen the knockout of that fight, that, you know, forget what was in front of him, we still got to put it away and it was brutal. But, you know, and to be fair to Booker, yeah, I mean, you know, he has been the, the distance with the guy who's fighting Joshua next, yeah? And actually gave him a torrid time in the first few rounds of that fight. So it he, he, he was a level where, where you'd say, wow, that, that's convinced me on, on Philip Ovich. But I've seen a lot worse on the 12 professional fight. So I understand where people are, are coming from. But it, it, Rob, you hit nail on head. You find an opponent for him who's not saying, I want $5 million to fight him. Yeah? It's, you know, it's a lot. They say, oh, I'll fight him. And then it's like, well, what do you want? Yeah? And it's, it's well, you know, I want the uh, I want 100 meter yacht, you know? So, that's great, but let's be, you know, it is not the time to be demanding supersonic purses, yeah? And, um, but what I understand is that, that Hunter is, is, uh, is being, going to be reasonable. He said he would do it first, he would do it for no post, so that sounds, that sounds fantastic. Not suggesting that, but, <laughs> but if, that's, if that's where we start, and then we definitely have a fight. Um, but it might do it for no but winner takes all. Um, but it's a, great, it's a great fight, you know, it's a, it's a good fight, and it's... Um, for, for both guys, it's, it's a fight to show where they're at. You know, I think we know where Philip's at, and I'm, I'm sure Michael will have his, his opinions of where he's at. So it's, um, you know, walk the walk time. You know, so um, it's been one of those fights to look, look forward to for the early part of uh, 2021, you know. One of the, the fights to look forward to for the heavyweight world boxing super series. Yeah, as part of it, you know, could be, could be a, good quarter. Could be, might, could be, might be a bit of a push, but yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But those are the sort of fights that you can make at any weight. You know, credit to, to to Frank for for the for his uh, Joyce and Dubois, which by the way is a 50-50. People stop calling it like Dubois is this massive favourite. Dubois is a very good talent. You know? But this is walk the walk time for him as well. Yeah? This is um, this is a big step up. Yeah, and and Joe can can do it all. And yes, he does get hit. But yes, he does stand there. He, you know, that that juggernaut title is uh, is quite a good one for him. Quite an apt one for him. And um, I think it's a cracking fight. You know, and 
and um, I'm looking, actually as a fan, I'm really looking forward to seeing that fight. Mentioned Daniel Dubois there, something I'd like to grab your opinion on. Eddie keeps alluding to certain sparring stories between Philip Hargovic and Daniel Dubois. He, he's been very coy about it. You're not very coy in general, Callow. You, you, you kind of say... No, things I think, listen, you know, I'm not coy about it. They had a, they had a sparring session and, and um, you know, it was... I wasn't there. Well, well, I would be much more open and honest about it. I'll tell you what exactly what happened. But I had a sparring session and I wasn't there. So, I mean, um, yeah, there's rumours that he had the better. I don't think it is what some people are saying, by the way, that, you know, he knocked him out in every round or something and he was, you know, sort of held up at the end. Oh, but uh, don't forget, that, that was also a couple of years ago. Daniel's grown. I saw Daniel, um, I think it was at Dale Youth, years ago. And I was just so impressed with the physical, his physical side. That was, he must have been like a, young teenager at the time or mid teenager and he looked fantastic then so he, he listen Dubois is the real deal it's just how how long does it take to get him to the top I don't know I don't know if Joyce is too early or it's, or it's the perfect time but we'll find out I don't want to read too much in that spine because even if it was the worst rumor that I heard was that yeah he just won every round but it, it wasn't there was no knockdowns that I heard of or anything like that I think mean, a lot have been made of it but but then it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, we put out there, let's do the Dubois fight now. Just to be clear, we said that before the Joyce fight was finally confirmed. It was, there was no, you know, oh, we should be in there, you know, do that. No, I think Joyce Dubois is a great fight. So it was, that was, um, that, um, was, let's say, misunderstood slightly. Like, you know, why don't we do the winner of the two? You know, Hunter, Hunter the Hergovich fights the winner of Dubois Joyce. That's a fight. That's a little tournament setting up. Now you see where I'm angling to here. You see where I'm angling to. One more fight and you can lift the trophy. <laughs> Always thinking. I like it. It's good. Okay, we're back. We had a little bit of issues with um, some devices and some, some incidents with Mr. Sowland, but we're all good now. It's Friday night, what do you expect? <laughs> yeah, fr Friday night. Maybe he's not. Friday night lockdown. Can you imagine, Rob? <laughs> Me and you hanging out on a Friday night. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Talking about the new weight division with the WBC is very sad. Exactly, exactly. I mean, um, yeah. What do you want me to say? I mean, the first, the first thing I would say is bridge your weight. I like the idea behind the name. It's got a very touching story, and I think it's a, it's a great story. I generally... I'm not for more weight classes. I'm not for more belts. I'm not for more weights. Um, but there's what was one interview from Tony Bellew. Um, we mustn't forget that the, the idea behind it, according to Mauricio, I haven't spoken to Mauricio about it yet. Um, the idea is a safety idea. Now in boxing, there's one, there's one argument in boxing always safety first. That's, that's, the be all and end all or else we wouldn't have a sport to talk about. That argument, if it's a valid one, is a winning one. Now, I just don't quite see how I've, like, I've worked with, especially the cruiserweights over so many years and uh, the heavyweights over so many years. In fact, those are the two weight classes um, that probably had the most to do with um, over the years. And, and I know cruiserweights in and out from their training and the, the proper cruiserweight champions and also the ones that have gone up. You know, look at, look at the current um, Muhammad Ali trophy champion, the WBSS winner, Myris Breedis. He walks around 98, 99 kilos between fights. Not fat, by the way. He's, he's a training fanatic. But that's his weight. He cocks down, he trains down in a healthy way to his 90 kilo fight weight you know so he cooks down to the limit um i can't see the the advantage he would have from the bridge away but then again that is my initial reaction in general no more belts no more titles no more weights plenty of them um you could almost make the argument we should be going back to the old school system of, of lesser weights. Um, but health and safety first. 
So let's not shoot it down that quickly. Let's listen to the arguments um, because I think that that's the basis behind it. And and you know, fair play, Mauricio comes out with these ideas. Some of them, some of them, they um, they, they get up people's uh, you know noses. And you know, for example, the the franchise champion. I think that's, you know, maybe that's lost in translation a little bit on the marketing side. I think there's better words than the franchise champion. I can, but once again, I can understand what he's trying to do. Um, but then, it, you know, m most people would say, well, every champion must defend against the mandatory. That's the whole purpose of the ranking system. Um, well, this one, it's a, you know, his main argument is a health one. It's a health and safety one, which is backed up by, you know, in the last 10 years, probably the most, or the last five years, the most prominent example of a cruiserweight champion going to heavyweight and losing. The one thing that I would say is that Tony, I'd like to talk to Tony about it as well, because it, it was just an interview, but I have a chat with him, because I think that what Tony, Tony went up to cruiserweight, uh, went up to heavyweight, and he beat David Hay. You know, so so he had he had success there. David A. People say, oh, but he was a cruiserweight as well. Yeah, he was a cruiserweight ten years ago. Uh, David hasn't been a cruiserweight since a long time. So he fought a heavyweight. He fought the heavyweight champion of you know was heavyweight champion over several years. So you know, where's the argument? I don't quite follow the argument there. He, he lost in his last fight against a cruiserweight in Alexander Ruzic. So I get Tony's argument. It's just that the practice in Tony doesn't really back up the argument. You know, look at Tony, we had his two most spectacular displays were against a former heavyweight champion in the world. And his final loss at heavyweight, was it heavyweight? No, it was a cruiserweight again, wasn't it? Yeah, but was against a cruiserweight either way. It was, you know, Uzik at the time was coming up. So it was at best a very light heavyweight. But, so I, I understand that whenever there's an, uh, 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 an argument around weight limits and classes and whatever, but uh, not a fan of more weights, no. It's kind but of I do like, but if there was a weight, Bridger Weight has got a bit of a story to it. I know it's been knocked about the name, but look at the, the story behind the name. I think it's quite a, quite a sweet story, you know? Yeah, so it's of the young man who was mauled by the dog protecting his Yeah, but it's a very good story. Um, you make a good point about Tony Bellew. I, I had uh, I interviewed Mauricio yesterday about it. I speak to Mauricio fairly regularly, and I kind of said to him, you know, Deontay Wilder, I think, had only weighed over 224 for I think for five of his fights, and like he'd only been more than five pounds. He'd only been five pounds over 224 pounds once, and that was against Fury. So he, he's boxed at 217. I, I mentioned Amanda Holyfield, who'd obviously beat Riddick Bowe. Riddick Bowe was 248, um, and Holyfield started as a light heavyweight. So it can be done, and it is an interesting one. Um, I do believe it is, it is for health reasons, and Mauricio wanting to improve the sport. What about between light heavy and cruising weight? That seems to me to be the obvious one to sort out, no? Am I crazy? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with you. I think, first of all, I'm not, I can't really talk too much on health and safety because I, I always find that that's really for doctors to talk yeah. about. But, but let's say in terms of fights, I can't name you a cruiserweight champion who has not struggled to make the weight. Mm. Right. I've looked after... Marco Hook, Hernandez, um, Steve Cunningham, um, Fira Arslan, obviously all the cruiserweights at WBSS. So I've had about 10 cruiserweight world champions. And, you know, world champions that were very successful for a long period of time. I was the co-promoter of David Hay. So I can tell you, from the experience that cruiserweight should really have a, a limit of about five kilos because anything above that, they're, they're too big for the other guys. There's, there's no light cruiserweight who's ever been any good. I, I can't name you one off the top of my head. There certainly hasn't been one in the last 10 years. Mm. You rarely find a light heavy going into cruiser and making a mark. Name, I can't, can you name me one? I, I can't name me one. I, I, I'd struggle. I'm, str I'm sure the viewers will come up with hundreds of names after this to embarrass us, but I can't 
think of a name that went from light heavy to cruiser, stayed there and, and made multiple defences with his title. Mm, yeah, uh, there might be an example of someone who went up and won a belt and lost mm. it. I mean, but I can't think in the last 10 years of anyone. All of them, all those names I've just mentioned to you, Hook, Cunningham, um, Hook Cunningham, Hernandez even, now he quit for five years, he's back with two broken shoulders, he's fighting a heavyweight. They're all, Breedis will go up to heavyweight. Um, all these champions, they go up to heavyweight. Now, is the argument they should be, you know, because they're, they're 90, you know, they're, they're at that 200 pound limit, but, but it's not, because they're not at that limit. They, they go down to get to the weight. You know, they are naturally, 100 kilo fighters, 102 kilo fighters, trained, yeah? Obviously training in different ways, but they, won't, they don't need to cut to make weight. They don't need to cut, you know, cut their diets or adapt their diets at certain times. They don't need to do the extra, you know, the extra cardio to get down to weight. They train in a different way, of course. But I can name you many, many examples of Smaller heavyweights beating bigger heavyweights. David Hay, probably the most prominent example of that. You know, um, but there's loads out there. I, again, I said to Mauricio, Mike Tyson. I've, Mike Tyson had 56 fights. And he, um, he was only about... over 224, so only over the bridge weight limit for his last five or six fights or something. And that's obviously yeah. he was heavier. He wasn't as dedicated, and you know he was a bridge weight in theory. Yeah. And it's, it's not like, you know, for me, go through that list of, of, let's say, the top 10, 12 heavyweights at the moment. I, I don't see that divide. I don't see that. I don't see that there is some supersonic fighter who can't make, he can't make 90, he can't make 100 kilo and, and, and be natural, not natural, but trained at that weight. Mm. You know, it's not it's, it's walking around weight, but after a training camp, I can't think of a, I can't think of an example of a fighter I've ever seen who, who can't make the heavyweight naturally, who's been a success at cruiserweight. Of course, there's examples. Heavyweight means, by the way, triple, quadruple, sinquuple, or whatever it's called, <laughs> five times the value of the purses than it is at cruiserweight. The natural inkling of anyone at cruiserweight is, boah, heavyweights, they're making the money. You know, and I don't know, I mean, we just established now, especially through the WBSS, like I said, I've been involved in so many years of cruiserweight, making cruiserweight world title fights, so many of them. And the WBSS has put the cruiserweight division on the map internationally for very, very good fights. Mm. So now we've got suddenly got a, 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 another way. Uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know where... The, the, the advantages commercially, I can't see. There's no advantages there from a sport. I can't see any advantages. But once again, it's Mauricio is making the health and safety argument, and that's one that has to be heard. So I don't know what the argument is because uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen what the doctors are. I haven't gone into that detail on it. I've followed it on on what you can read on the on the internet, more or less. You know, so. I can't give you first down experience. I, like I said, I think Tony makes a very valid argument because he's a fighter. He has he has more right to talk about it than any, any of the other people I've seen talk about it. And but his 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 argument doesn't add up to the practice of his career, in my humble opinion. You know, Tony had massive success at heavyweight. He beat David A when everyone wrote Tony in the not so much in the second fight, of course, but in the first fight. No one was backing Tony. It, 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 it maybe people swung a bit through the fight week and you know all the drama and have it, but when that first when the fight got made, it was like what Raoul will hate take his head off. You know, that was it. That was the talk. And, and I'm not having anyone now say, oh no, but you know a lot of people were backing Benny. You no, know, no one was backing Benny. You know, well not publicly. You know, so yeah, that was a proper underdog fight. And that was against the, you know, heavyweight champion. He wasn't at the time, but he was, was successful as a heavyweight champion of the world. By the way, 
David didn't lose the fight to Klitschko because of his size. Yeah, that's for sure. It's maybe his tactics were wrong that night. There was a lot of, lot of talk about what the different arguments were. But it wasn't a size argument. There was never a size argument for David. He fought a lot of bigger men and beat a lot of bigger men. Yeah, it, it is a head scratcher. I do feel, as I say, I do feel it's born out of a place of wanting to do the right thing for the sport and wanting to, to make the sport a healthier yeah, place. Yeah, I think, I think the motives are right. I don't think Marissa is not doing this to, to earn extra money. I think it's a tough sell. I spoke to several promoters this week. Everyone's like, I ain't doing that. I'm not going to do that. Will they? I don't know. I mean, at the end, we mustn't forget, titles are born out of demand. They're born out of demand from the broadcasters and the fans and the promoter's job is to serve that. And that there's nothing more recognisable than a world title fight in our sport. It's a tangible. It's a tangible. So, you know, not for the hardcore, so don't go bite my head off. I'm talking about the sports fan who's got his Sky Remote stuck after a football match and the boxing comes on. If it's the Intercontinental Whoopa Duppa title, right, sponsored by Ronald McDonald, he's turning over. If it's the world title, there's a chance he'll stay on. And that's simple. That is, I mean, everyone understands that. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the sport is a completely different thing. I'm just stating the facts of the, the, the chain here. It's not, it's not the Federation's fault. It's not the promoter's fault. It's not the fans' fault. It's not the media uh, TV rights, it's the way the circle of life in boxing works. And that is not my opinion, that is a fact. So Judge Keller, on this case, wants to <laughs> further time to deliberate. Well, no, no, I, I, I will go as, uh, I will go as uh, uh, not in support, but I need, I need further argumentation from the, uh, from the accused. But no, I mean, I think Mauricio has done great things with the WBC. And, uh, he has his reasoning for it, and I think that needs to be heard. I don't think that's really got out there because everyone's come kind of bomb, you know. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, but in general, I'm not a fan of it. But at the end of the day, health and safety will always win for me. Okay, well, Callum, we got. I love that, that Judge Callum. I feel all formal now. I feel like I've just put the hammer down. It's good because you are, you are like, you know, to, it's slightly tongue in cheek, but you are an impartial voice somewhat in boxing. You work with everybody. You don't. Yeah, really, you yeah. Don't really I'm not. The, I'm not the UN, mate. You are. You bring all, <laughs> you bring all of these fighters together from all these different promotional companies and put them in great fights. For for me, oh, Rob, I, 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 I need you to, I need you to earwig in some of my conversations, and then, <laughs> then you might have a different opinion. I'm trying to give you the big sell, Keller. <laughs> thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much. Checks in the post. <laughs> thank you, and thank you as always for speaking to Boxing Social. I do want to echo what I said before: the World Boxing Super Series is brilliant for boxing. We can't wait for it to be back. Kala Sowland, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Thank you very much, Rob, and see you soon.